Uh, if you don't know, we are in the series, I Am. Can you say, I Am? This is all about the character of Jesus Christ. And this week, it's going to be on I Am the Vine. We're going to be reading from John 15. Last week, Pastor Neil preached an excellent sermon on I Am the Good Shepherd. And this time in week five, we'll be talking about one of the things that Jesus said in John 15 before he was arrested, put on trial, and went to the cross. So would you turn with me to John chapter 15? I have to say, um, I've been pastoring here now for just about two and a half months, and it has been one of the greatest joys and blessings of my life to serve in this congregation. This is a beautiful, wonderful, thriving church community of people who have joy that is unexplainable except by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a privilege to stand before you this morning and share the gospel. So let's, let's read from John chapter 15. Starting in verse 1. It says this. I am the true vine. Say true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already, say already. You are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide, say abide. It's going to be said a lot. Abide, abide, abide. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides. Say abide again. Abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. But if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends." For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are in awe of your beauty. We are thankful for your grace. We are thankful for your word. We know that you are the source of all life. There is no one else that we can go to to get what we need but you. Lord, I pray that you would speak through your words today. Teach us what it means to abide in you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. 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 Jesus teaches us two things or he tells us two things in this passage about why he is speaking this to, to us. And the first thing he says in verse 11 is that he taught this to make his joy in us full. Are you lacking joy this morning? The world is in a tumultuous place right now. There are wars going on. There is political unrest. There is divide. Maybe you're not thinking about the world's unrest. Maybe you're not thinking about the world's lack of joy, but you're thinking about the lack of joy in your own family, in your own household, in the places that you go most often. Maybe it's your workplace. Are you lacking joy this morning? Well, I think that Christ has joy for you. He says that he teaches us this, to make his joy in us full. Secondly, he commands us these things so that we will love one another. Are you lacking in the love of Christ this morning? This is a word for you. I believe that if we understand what Jesus is teaching in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17, 
that we will be so abounding in joy, so full of love for one another, that we will say to ourselves, I am so glad that I am not where I used to be. I believe that Jesus Christ has a word for you specifically this morning. And he wants to fill you with his joy. He wants to fill you with love for one another. He wants to transform your life. So I think that if we understand this passage, we will really understand what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to break down this passage into four simple sections. I just want to talk about, first, the fruitful branches. Jesus talks about a couple different characters in this metaphor. He uses this metaphor of a vine and branches. Are any of you like me and you are not, you do not have a green thumb? You kill every plant that you touch? That's me. That's me. I've kept one plant alive for the past year, and it's a succulent. If you know anything about plants, you know that that is the easiest plant to keep alive. I water it maybe once every two months. That thing is crying out for water. Right now, I saw it this morning, and it was dying. I am not a green thumb, but you might be. You know, sometimes I read the metaphors that Jesus gives, and I'm like, I wish that you would have said something that I could understand better from my own life. You know, like maybe you could have said, I am the burger, and you are the fries. I am the iPhone and you are the charger. I don't know, something like that. You know, 21st century Jesus could have figured out something that I would get. But there is a profound message inside of this metaphor that Jesus gives of the vine and the branches. And I took some time in preparation for this message to to ponder and reflect over the reality of what Jesus is saying here. And Jesus is making a wonderful and powerful image of how we are to understand our relationship to him. So he talks about these four different characters in this metaphor that we were going to talk about. The first is the fruitful branches, the ones that abide. The second are the detached branches. They are the ones who do not abide. The third is God, the gardener. And the fourth is Christ, the vine. Now, before we go any further, we need to talk about what this word abide means. If you you have a different translation than me, yours might say remain. Well, this word abide, it comes from this Greek word meno. And all it means is a strong connection. Anytime you see Jesus say abide in this passage, he is talking about the vital connection between the branches and a vine on a plant. Think about like a tree stem and its branches, that vital connection. It is a strong bond. If you look at uh, Merriam-Webster, it defines this word abide as to remain stable or fixed in a state or to continue in a place. Abiding communicates to us this idea of a branch and that connection it has to the stem, to the vine where it is utterly dependent upon the stem for all of the resources that it will get. If it is disconnected, it is unrooted. It will not last in a storm. Does that ever feel like your life? That when a storm comes, you don't feel like you have that persevering power. You feel detached. You feel separated from the source of life. Well, Jesus has a word for us today, and he wants to teach us what it means to have that strong bond that vital connection to his source of life so that no matter what storms may come, no matter what darkest night we find ourselves in, that the light of Christ would shine in our hearts. Is that a good word for today? So anytime you hear this word abide, I want you to think of this word meno, to remain, to remain stable or in a fixed state, to have that strong bond a connection to Jesus Christ. So as we break down this passage, I just want to start talking about the fruitful branches or the true disciples. Jesus says that these are the ones that they prove to be the disciples of Jesus, the true ones, the ones that last, the ones that remain, the ones that endure, the ones that stay connected in the storm. Well, Jesus has to teach us a lot about what these branches look like. First, he teaches us that they produce greatly. 
In verse 5, he says that they bear much fruit because they do two things. They remain vitally connected to the vine and abiding because they are abiding in Jesus. They're remaining this, in this strong bond to Jesus. And secondly, Jesus is remaining in a strong bond with them. It's a, it's a two-sided thing. A lot of you have a relationship with God that is one-sided. But I want you to know this morning that God is reaching out to you. God initiates. It's not just we to God. It is God to us. He must remain in us and we must remain in him. Well, what does it mean to bear fruit? I think that it can mean a lot of things scripturally, but it means at least three things. First, it means a character change. The scriptures talk about the fruits of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and if you know them, you know the rest. It is a character change, an inner transformation that happens. When Jesus came and he did his ministry, he wanted us to know that he wanted to change us, not from the outside in, from, but from the inside out. Amen. Jesus produces a character tra- change in us so that when we are abiding in Christ, when we are bearing fruit, that you see the evidence of it in our life. Because our hearts are changed, what was broken is healed, What was split in two is mended so that when we behave, you see the fruits of the Spirit within us. You have joy that is unfounded anywhere but in Christ. You have peace to endure the hardest storm. You have character change. The second thing is that you make disciples that abide. Jesus' command to us in Matthew 28 was this, that we would go and make disciples. We are part of this process of helping other people see what the vine is and connecting them. Christ works in us to make disciples that last, to show other people the truth and to help guide them in it. But I I think there's a third characteristic of bearing fruit, which is, yes, that we have character change. Yes, that we are making disciples, but it's also a third unique type of making disciples. You see, God has placed a dream and a passion inside of every one of us. He has created within you a unique story to fill a need in this world that only you can fill empowered by God. There are people in this world that are looking for things to be solved. And I I need to tell you this morning that God wants to bear fruit in you to solve a problem that only you are passionate about. That, That you are telling others, isn't this a thing that we need to fix? Maybe it's inside of the church and you're like, I want to see these people ministered to. Might it be that God has placed that dream in your life because he has called you to fulfill it? Because that's kind of the the kind of fruit that he wants to bear in your life. So when we talk about fruit, they are bearing much fruit. They have much change inside of them. They are producing disciples and they are fulfilling the needs of others. They are fulfilling the passions that God has placed in their life. Don't you want that? The second thing is that they are clean and they are cleaned. In verses 1 and 2, it teaches us that God prunes them to cause them to bear fruit. He says the ones that are bearing fruit, he prunes. Now, if you think about pruning, it involves a surgical process on a branch. It's, it's not necessarily a pretty picture. It's a painful process. It's where you're literally cutting something off that was once connected I want you to think about this, because a lot of us think that when we experience hard things, when God removes something from our life, it means he doesn't love us. But the scriptures teach us that God removes things because he loves us, because he knows that every other thing that we will place in between us and God is only going to take life, not bring it. God wants to remove the things that we are are, that are sucking our life so that he can fill us with new and abundant life. God wants to prune us. I have learned in in my short time on this earth, and I'm sure I will learn more, that, that grief for me, even though it is one of the hardest things to go through, and I know there are many here that are thinking, you have gone through grief like no other. But grief shows me God's love. In times of pain, in times of removal, in times of pruning, God has taught me his closeness and his true love. I need you to tell you this morning, I need to tell you this morning that that God prunes because he loves. Because he wants to see you thriving. He wants to see you bear more fruit. 
What does the word say? Jesus says that the word he has spoken to them makes them clean. In verse 3, what does Hebrews 4.12 say? That for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It reminds me of the psalmist who says, search me and know me. Search me and know my heart. See if there be any grievous way in me. God, through his word, cleanses us by allowing us to experience conviction and see the things that he wants to cut off. And when he reveals it to us, our only response is to say, Lord, take it. Because there is nothing in this world that you will surrender for God, that you will get to heaven and say, oh, I wish I didn't surrender that. Everything that you surrender for God is worth it. Because when you're in heaven, when you're rejoicing with your Lord, when you see the fruit of what he is bearing in your life, you will know it was worth it. That was garbage compared to the abounding life that God has for me. So, so they produce greatly. These branches are clean, and they are cleaned. They are specially chosen. Jesus says in verse 16, he says that he chose them. They did not choose him. They are specially selected. In verse 16, he also says that they are appointed by God to bear fruit that abides, fruit that remains, fruit that lasts. They are specifically chosen and appointed by God. What confidence does that stir up in someone? Ooh, great. What confidence does that stir up in somebody to know that they are chosen and appointed by God? It was no mere accident that they find themselves in God's kingdom in the church that God specifically picked them. They enjoy a close relationship to Jesus. In verse 15, he says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. You know, the God who created the heavens and the earth calls you his friend. But there are conditions to it. He says they are his friends if they do what he commands them. He also says that he calls them his friends because they know what he's up to in verse 15. They know what his father's up to. They're not ones who are ignorant of the workings of God. They know how God works. They have this spiritual closeness and intimacy with God that they they understand how he works. They know his patterns. They know his movements, his rhythms. Just like you know your friend and you know their personality, they know the personality of God. These branches that bear fruit, they have the enjoyment of this close relationship with Jesus. And and one of the perhaps most shocking things about this passage is that Jesus teaches us that these branches, they get what they ask for. That's shocking. In verse 7, Jesus says that if they remain in him and his words in them, they can ask whatever they wish and it will be done for them. That's wild that anything I can ask for, it will be done. In verse 16, he says that they are specially chosen and appointed to bear fruit so that whatever they ask the Father in his name, he may give it to them. That is insane. But some of you are hearing that this morning. You're thinking, I've asked for something and God didn't give it to me. Well, here's here's what I need to tell you. That if you know what the Father's up to, if you know this close relationship with him, if you have the spiritual intimacy with him, then when you ask for something and you don't receive it, it causes you to think one of three things. Because these mature branches, they know one of three things, that if they ask for something and they did not receive it, they may not be abiding. They check themselves. They think, well, maybe I'm not enjoying this closeness with Christ that I thought, and he is teaching me something. The second thing is that they check their request. Perhaps their request that they're asking for isn't actually the thing that their soul is asking for in its deep need. They know the workings of their father and that the father is not going to give them a bad gift when they ask for a good gift. So maybe that God actually wants to prune the thing they're asking for because he's saying, I don't want you to receive that because it would distract you from me. I want you to not get that so that you can get me instead. Because the real need that you want inside of you I want to fill that myself, and that thing's not going to fill it. The third thing is that those who are mature and abiding, they know the workings of their father. If if they don't receive it, and maybe they've checked themselves, they're like, I am abiding. Maybe they've checked their request, and they're like, I know this is good from the scriptures. The third thing is that they check their expectations. They check their timeline. The promise here is not whatever they ask for, they will receive it in that moment. 
You see, there are a lot of prayers that we are praying for restoration and healing, things that God is like, I have a better plan for when I'm going to fulfill that thing that you asked for. And we all know that we are hoping for the ultimate restoration. When in heaven, we will have perfect transformed bodies that every prayer for healing will come to pass. That these broken bodies that we live in now, the things that we're asking God to heal for, even when God heals on this earth in a moment, we know that we have bodies that are passing away. But God has promised that for those who remain faithful to him, that he will restore us with eternal bodies that will not perish or fade away. So they, they, they know to check themselves, they know to check their request, and they know to check their expectations. They know how God works, and that truly, as Romans 8.28 says, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. These branches, they know it. The next thing is that they maintain a vital connection, not just to Christ, but catch this, to his love. You ever met somebody in the church that they, they look like they are close to Christ, but they have no love? What does Paul say? Paul says that if I have all these great things but not love, I'm just like a, a loud, annoying noise. I'm like a clanging cymbal or gong. These ones, they remain close, abiding in Christ's love. They have this strong bond to his love. In verse 9, how do you remain in this strong love with Jesus, they will abide in his love, as verse 10 says, by keeping his commandments. Isn't that wild? People like to paint this picture of our faith of Christianity where it's just rules, rules, rules. But I think when you understand how much God really loves you and has saved you, and it's not by your works that you are saved, then his commandments become a way for us to say thank you. And that actually doing what he asks, we are blessed by remaining in his love. How wild is that? But what are Jesus' commands? In verse 12, Jesus says, Jesus commands them to love one another the same way that he loved them. The same way that he loved them. That's the command, is to love. Any sin that you ever commit, any way that you hurt somebody else, you can search and ask the question, how was I not being loving here? Jesus is commanding that they love. That's how they maintain a vital connection to Christ's love is by loving him and by loving others. And the last thing of of these types of branches is that in bearing much fruit, catch this, they prove to be Jesus' disciples, as, as I said. But in verse 8, they glorify God. Who am I to glorify God? Who are you to glorify God who created the heavens and the earth? Jesus' mission, as he came on earth, he kept talking about how he was there to glorify his Father in heaven. And now here he says that in bearing much fruit, these branches prove to be Jesus' disciples, and they glorify God. I don't know about you, but I want to be that type of branch. I want to be that type of true disciple. But the second thing that Jesus talks about is detached branches. These are branches that are dead. These are branches that are ineffective. If you, if you put it another way, you might think about detached people, dead people, ineffective people. You see, there is a contrast here, and I think it's important to know that these are the ones that do not bear fruit. And Jesus says in verses 4 and 5, they do not bear fruit because they cannot bear fruit. Why? They cannot bear fruit because they're detached from Jesus. Anything, Jesus says in in the scriptures that we are supposed to judge by fruit. That we're supposed to look at the produce of what comes out. Now, I think there is fruit that is produced, but in this scripture, Jesus is saying that that fruit isn't even fruit. It's counterfeit. He doesn't even consider it. He says that, that they produce nothing. Because he knows that the only thing that can really be considered fruit Fruit that that brings sustenance, fruit fruit that blesses, is fruit that comes from him because anything else is counterfeit. But but as we talk about this, we need to know that there there are a couple different types of ways that this not abiding in Christ can take shape. This this being detached from Christ, this not being fixed to him. Maybe you're not abiding in Christ in a general sense. Like nobody in your life would think, 
you're not abiding in Christ. Maybe you're like, I'm an atheist, or I'm, I'm an agnostic, or I'm an unbeliever, or I'm just kind of searching it out. I don't, I don't want anything to do with religion. Well, you may think that when we talk about this, that, that God actually is bringing judgment, that God is, is allowing people to be separate from him, that do not choose him. You may think that's cruel. You may ask the Lord, like, you may say, why can't God just give me his goodness in life apart from himself? But that can't happen. It is not cruel that God refuses us, refuses to give us eternal life and joy apart from himself. From himself. And here's why. Many want life, but not God. Many want his joy and his peace, his fulfillment and satisfaction, his endurance and order, his blessing and his ultimate goodness, but not God himself. We want the heat of the sun, but not its day. We want the warmth of a fire, but not its light. You cannot separate the good from its source. You cannot take the life and not the founder of all life. This is why we cannot have goodness apart from God. Not only is it unreasonable, it is impossible. It doesn't even make sense. C.S. Lewis says correctly that God is the fuel we were designed to run on. Anything else is counterfeit. This is why if we look back to Genesis in the garden after Adam and Eve sinned for the first time, God removes them from the garden and does not allow them to eat from the tree of life, knowing that if they eat from it, they will live forever. Because God knows that for them to live with this disconnection from God is death. It is eternal, an eternal life of death. Though they live physically, they are dead spiritually. God had a different plan in mind, and he has that plan in mind today. It's a better way, a way in which the only way we truly get life to the full is when we remain connected to him. Because that's the only abundant life you can have when you're connected to the source. When we abide in Jesus... Because any other life is living in the same way that cancer is living. It does nothing but consume, destroy, and take life. That's the kind of life apart from God. God cannot give you life apart from himself. So don't expect him to. We, we think that we have this abundant life now, yet it's just living on the remnants of the original life that God breathed into humanity. We are living in a broken world with life that is not... In the, the life that is not intended for us. That's why we experience so much brokenness in this world and why we see so much conflict. That's why our hearts and souls dream of these fantastical stories where there is a happy ever after because we're longing for something that is actually available to us. God has placed that desire in us because he knows that there's fulfillment. His life is true all else is counterfeit. It's bankrupt. It doesn't count for anything. You see, everyone has a vine, whether it's Jesus or not. Tim Keller says this. He says that everyone basically has a God, whether they say that they're religious or not. And the question today is, what is your God? What is your vine? What is the ultimate thing that you are building your life on that you are trying to find your significance in? Because that is the thing that you're seeking salvation through. You are seeking that thing to fulfill you. It could be your health. It could be vocational success, money, sex, physical beauty, intelligence, being ethical, people who say, I'm pretty good, I'm all right. Athletics. It could be your family culture. It could be your relationships or looking for romantic love to fulfill you. Or it could be yourself, your own image. Let me prove to you that that thing is insufficient. Let me prove to you that that thing is insufficient because when that thing is threatened in your life, you know what it's like to have your whole life shaken. The second that you get a diagnosis and your health was the thing you were building your life on, your whole life is shaken. You're in deep despair. If, if your money is the thing that you're building your life on, well, the second that you lose money or we're in a bad economic state, your whole life is shaken, disrupted. If, if it's a romantic relationship, you're, you're building your whole life among getting that person and getting the fulfillment from them. You're going to drive that relationship into the ground because you're expecting something from them that they cannot give you. And the second that they leave you or reject you in any way, your whole life will be shaken, will be stirred. These are things that cannot sustain us through the hardships of life. These are the things that cannot sustain us through the hardest things that we go through. They're not things that last. 
You see, when your vine is threatened, your whole life is threatened. If it's not on Jesus. If it's somebody else that makes a mistake that causes your thing to be threatened that you're building your life on, then you're going to be bitter towards that person in a deep way that will consume your soul. If it's yourself that causes that thing to be threatened, then you're going to hate yourself for the rest of your life. And I know that you know what I'm talking about. But there is someone that you can build your life on that cannot be threatened. One that is more powerful than any suffering that you would ever go through. Someone that can sustain you in suffering and pain, a hope that lasts through the deepest pain, a light that shines in the, deep, the, the dark, darkest night. And this is Jesus Christ. Now, I want to I talk about two more types of not abiding in Christ because if you're a Christian in the church, you might think, well, I'm abiding in Christ, so it's, it's good. It's just them, those who are not followers of Christ that need this message. Well, let me tell you, there are two types of people in church that I believe are also not abiding in Christ, and God wants to prune some things in their life. These are the ones that are not truly abiding in Jesus. They may appear to, but they don't. Let me, let me share some things about these people. These people are in church or part of a church community. They may call themselves Christians, but Jesus is not their all. They are really still building their life on something else before Christ, and that is their all. It's Jesus and something else. It's, I will follow Jesus as long as I get this thing. Christ does not have their life fully. They do not have Christ's life fully. And so they medicate symptoms by what they can glean from the goodness in a great church community, but they're not changed from the inside out. These types of people will do the rhythms of church, but their fruit does not last. Like in verse 16, they don't truly make disciples of Jesus. They just meet their feel-good religious quotas for the week of how they can feel like they are good. And at the end of the day, they say, I'm a Christian, I'm all set. They are spiritual takers, not givers. They do not make disciples. They don't want to use their gifts for God. They don't want to do the thing that he's calling them to. Maybe it's starting a small group or, or doing some sort of ministry or whatever it may be, however big or small. And it's not just that they don't want to because there are a lot of things that we don't want to do, but we do anyways. These are the people that are like, God, never. I'm not going to do it. They don't help fill the needs that they see. They always frame things as what the church needs to fix or do for them, not as what God could be calling them to do. They do not abide in Jesus truly. Because just like the first type of people, they are building their life on a shaky foundation, something that will not last. I think there's some of that in all of us that needs to be pruned. And the last type of people that are the detached branches or the detaching branches are those that do not abide in the true Jesus. Let me read some things about these. These are like Pharisees who are the people who appear to worship God but are unchanged on the inside, though they project a pride in their external holiness. They are devoid of love, devoid of the full characteristics of a Christ follower saved by grace. It may be rules, regulations, a counterfeit holiness, and a religious pride. These people are just like the other two, but they trick themselves that they are faithful. They are perhaps the most deceived because they think they're on the in, but they are not trusting in Christ's saving power. They are their own Savior, their own God. Similar to those that think they can be the faithful without Christ, they try, just like the Pharisees, to earn their own salvation. And when they can't live up to perfection, they try to take God's place as judge. They worship their perfection, not a God who gives them grace. For them, the cross is not sufficient. They have yet to be changed by the gospel, the good news. This is not abiding in the true Jesus. All of these ways are insufficient. Whether you are judging others because you think that you're perfect, or whether you are under this great condemnation because you know you're not, these are not the ways to truly abide in Jesus. There is another and better way to abide now, the truth that we need to talk about is the third person in this story is God, the gardener. He takes care of his garden because he is a good Lord. He's a good God. James 4.12 says, There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. This passage in John 15 teaches us that God will care for his garden. He will purify who he needs to, and he will judge who is unattached. Because those people have said to God, Lord, I don't want you to be my God. I want my own life. And God is saying to those people, okay, 
but you are deceived in thinking that life apart from me is life. The question we need to ask ourselves this morning is, who are we? Are we the fruitful branches or are we the detached branches? Are we the ones who are truly abiding in Christ? Or are we the ones who are detached, who are lifeless, who don't have this solid foundation to endure the hardest storm? The question we need to ask is, what should God do with you if he's taking good care of his garden? You see, the truth is, whether we've been faithful believers for a long time or whether we just started following Christ or whether we're not following him at all, all of us have failed Jesus' commandment in verse 12, to love one another as Christ has loved us. We are all selfish in some way or another. If we're honest, we don't belong in the true disciples' categories, at least not by our own merit. We all need Christ to change us, to show us how to abide. We all need him to take the first initiative. We need a savior. We need someone to to go before us to make us right with God, to reattach us and to show us what it means to live the true life. Thank God that Jesus is that savior. Let's talk about Jesus, the true vine. He's the one source of true life. In John chapter 1, verse 4, it says this, that in him, in Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Jesus is the only way. Jesus is our only hope. Jesus is the only source of true life that we need to be connected to. Jesus, in verse 10, it says that he, connect, uh, he kept God's commands, and he remained in God's love. He did what we were not able to do on our own. Jesus has loved us to the same degree that the Father has loved him. In verse 9, Jesus says that the greatest love is to lay down your life for your friends. Well, in verse 13, Jesus shows us that he has that kind of love for us. So the question becomes today, would you lay down your life for Christ? Would you live for him? Because you are met with eternal life when you surrender to the Lord Jesus. I am here telling you about the gospel because I truly believe that it is really good news that our God is that good, that we have tried to build our lives on everything else and we've said no to God in every way that we can possibly conceive. But he still sought after us and said, I want to be connected to you. The people who are the true branches, they are chosen by God. They are loved by God. He chose us first. He loved us more. And he made a way. Philippians 3.8 says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Tim Keller says this. He says that the gospel is that Jesus Christ came to earth, lived the life we should have lived, and died the death we should have died. So that when we believe in him, we live a life of grateful joy for him. We are filled up. He also says that the gospel is that we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Is that good news this morning? He loved us to the bottom, he says. Or he knew us to the bottom. He knew our deepest selves. He knew our deepest, darkest selves. But he loved us to the skies. That is the kind of God that we serve. So I, I promised you before, before I started that this would teach us how to abide in Jesus Christ. This would teach us how to, how to get joy to the full, how to love one another. What is the application for this? Well, the question for you this morning is, what does God want to prune in your life? What is he speaking to you that he's calling you to surrender, to give up? And what is he calling you to take on in its place? And settle it in your heart right now to do it, to do it, by his grace to do it. 
Write it down. Make a commitment. Talk to somebody and say, I want to do this for the Lord. I want to give this thing up. I want to create this space for him in his life, or him to take his place in my life. How is God calling you today to truly abide in Jesus? What kind of fruit does God want to see in your life? Is he calling you to start a Bible plan, to learn about this, this vine that we may know him and be connected to him? Is he calling you to join a life group, to, to walk in faith with other believers? Is he calling you to start a life group? Is he calling you to spend time with him daily? Is he calling you to come back again, even though you've been gone for some time? Is he calling you to share the gospel with somebody? If there is anything that God is calling you to do and you're wondering, I don't think I can do this on my own, first, ask for his provision. Second, settle it in your heart. And third, get someone else to do it with you. If, if you don't have somebody else that, that will do it with you, I'm encouraging you, take a connect card. Write down, I want to do this. I don't know how. I want to start this thing, and I don't know how. I want to minister in this way. I want to fulfill the dream God has placed in my life in this way. I don't know how. Give it to our Connect Center, and we, are, we will look at it, and we want to help you. We, we are a church that is here to help people see the dreams that God has placed in their life realized. We want to see you fulfilling the gospel, the Great Commission, in the way that God has called you to. Let us help you. Let us give you ideas. Talk to other people who who want to help you and do it alongside of you. The call today to all the Christians is to surrender your life to Jesus fully, to continue the course, to continue abiding, to continue to find your life in him fully. But the second group of people I want to talk to are those who hear this message and they think, I am a detached branch. I am lost. I don't have the hope that lasts through the darkest night I need the life of Christ that he offers. If that's you this morning, what I want to tell you is that he is calling you to himself. He wants you and his family. And all he's saying is, I've given my life up for you. Would you just stop trying to take control of everything and let me take control? Would you let me do it? The scriptures say this, that Jesus Christ, he came and he died for our sins on the cross. He paid the debt that we owed. He lived the life that we should have lived. He died the death that we should have died. And on the third day, he rose again to show that he was God and that he defeated death, that he was more powerful than your sin, more powerful than your guilt. And that if you believe in him, if you trust in his name, you will be saved. You will have life to the full. You will be adopted into the family of God. John chapter 1 says that to, to all who received Christ, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. I don't know what your family's like. I don't know how broken it is. But God wants to tell you today. He wants you in his family. If you would boldly say this morning, I want to follow Jesus. I want to surrender my life to him. Would you just raise your hand and just say, Lord, I'm giving my life to you. Would you make that bold proclamation this morning? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray a prayer together. Christian, would you repeat after me? This prayer is not magical. It's just surrendering your life to the Lord. It consists of admitting that you're a sinner, that you need God's grace, believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, that he rose again, and third, confessing that Jesus is Lord. Would you repeat after me with all heads bowed and eyes closed? Father God, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you died for my sin. I know that you paid my debt on the cross and that you rose again on the third day. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and I confess that I'm going to live for you for the rest of my days. Jesus Christ is Lord. Help me to live for you, God. Jesus name. Amen.